My name is Dele Ogmisheto and I am a professor and a chair uh, of public health here at UC Irvine. And just before the larger audience came in, we were welcoming our new students, graduate students, masters in public health, PhD in public health, uh, to our campus. They introduced themselves and shared views with faculty and we talked about the excitement of embarking on something uh, new and different, a career path. And um, those who have been uh, pursuing their careers for some time also get the opportunity to hear something new from uh, those who are beginning. We have a very large program compared to many other programs in public health or even schools of public health, in part because of the excitement that the undergraduate majors bring uh, to our campus. Uh, we open up the seminar series that we have every uh, other Monday to undergraduate students, to graduate students, to members of our community, and we're delighted to host uh, the launch after the seminar series. In the spring quarter, we have an open house where we do the launch with the uh, presentation. I hope that our speaker uh, doesn't mind that. I know that he's already had something to, to uh, eat and drink. Uh, but these seminar series are made possible because of the generosity in time and spirit of our students, faculty, and, and staff. Uh, nominees are presented by anyone in our community, something, someone, they, or topic that they'd like to bring to campus. And we present dates, and uh, hopefully something works out. Sometimes. We have to postpone um, visitors to campus because uh, of scheduling conflicts. And so it's not unusual that it takes sometimes two years for us to get the right time for somebody we really want to visit us to come. And the same uh, is true for our speaker today. Uh, we also collaborate with the Office of Extension uh, to videotape these presentations so that even as we are full in the hall today, uh, those who are not able to be here have the opportunity to uh, listen to the presentation, ask questions, interact with us, and interact also with the speaker. We couldn't have asked for a better topic today or a better person to uh, be with us today than Dr. Uh, Clem Bezel. And he will talk to us today about Public Health 2030. He's in the old tradition, what we will call a, a wizard. Uh, people who can predict the future. Uh, so I, I'm sure he wears that title uh, proudly and uh, that he will convince us today that he's earned uh, the title of being uh, someone who can see into the future. He's uh, the chairman and senior futurist at the Institute for Alternative Futures, uh, IAF, which he established with Alvin Toffler uh, to encourage anticipatory democracy. When um, we were meeting with the prospective students, uh, one of our faculty members, uh, Dr. Terry Schmidt, uh, said that he's known Dr. Bezel for more than uh, 15 years. And Terry is the one who uh, nominated Dr. Bezel to come with us, and he's uh, sat standing there uh, in the back. He would be giving this introduction, except that he has a very, very hoarse voice. Uh, but we are thankful that he's recovering well. So I don't know um, in the 15 years what aspects of Dr. Bezel, uh, his career that Terry interacted with, but when I saw the length of uh, accomplishments and uh, engagements that Dr. Bezel uh, has, has uh, in his resume, it's really very impressive indeed. So he's a political scientist by training and he developed uh, foresight techniques uh, 
uh, applying future research and strategic planning methods in both public and private sectors. Uh, he's particularly interested in health and has worked with the World Health Organization, the American Cancer Society, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, National Institute of Health, and HRSA. Uh, he's been a leader on a wide range of futures work with medical and health professional organizations and associations. Uh, past and current clients include the American Medical Association, the American College of Surgeons, American Osteopathic Association, um, I would like to see American Public Health Association or Association of Schools of Public Health on that list and I think today uh, he's been giving this, this talk to health communities uh, nationwide uh, and um, uh, today um, you know, the challenge will be let's get the public health representative associations on this list and I, I, I offer that challenge and I'm sure uh, it will be very, very meaningful for us. Uh, Dr. Bezold has published extensively. He's authored 11 books on the future of government, work, and health, and he serves on the editorial advisory boards of technology, forecasting, and social change, the Journal of Future Studies, and World Future Review and Foresight. Uh, for all his work in 2011, the World Future Society honored Dr. Bezold with, with its Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you so much for coming to share with us today. Please join me to welcome Dr. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Deli. I should say at the outset that, um, oh, <laughs> I placed that well, didn't I? The, uh, we'll move this around. And this around. Okay. So, um, oh, so uh, Delhi wants the American Public Health Association and other public health groups to be on my list, and they will be. And that what I'm about to present you, um, George's Benjamin's the head of the APHA. He was on our advisory committee. The head of NATO, the head of ASTO. We're all on the group that helped produce these. And in the scenarios I'm about to produce, uh, present to you, were, are just are, will be released in May. So you're getting a pre-release version. But we've developed these with the public health community. And so, so um, with that, I'll move. Uh, I'll move into it. It's a great honor to be here. Um, uh, and so, so this is you know what. So what's public health? You guys are students of public health, professors of public health. Sort of what is it? And you know, um, IOM roughly says the Institute of Medicine, that, that public health is what a society collectively does to ensure the conditions for people to be healthy. Public health departments do a slice of that, and that's probably primarily what we'll focus on in these scenarios. But the who, what, and how of public health is evolving, and not always in consistent directions. And so, while Delhi says that I can predict the future, we, we say as futurists, we, we don't predict the future, because if you go with one prediction, you're probably in trouble. You actually want a range of forecasts and scenarios, which is what I'm about to present to you, to do that in order to understand. I'm also going to ask you to become futurists. I'm going to ask you to think about the likelihood of the scenarios I'm going to present to you, uh, as well as your, the preferability, what you, what you like the most about them. But, but scenarios, in effect, give you the ability to look at uncertainty, in this case public health, and say what's, what's happening in that regard. And so this particular project is funded by the, by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Kresge Foundations based on other projects that we had done, including Vulnerability 2030, Primary Care 2025, and Health and Healthcare 2032. All those are on, if you Google those, are all on our websites. Uh, but they're different explorations. The purpose of this public health project is to explore the key forces shaping public health to consider the future of public health functions, financing, and sustainability. What is it, particularly about those public health departments uh, and agencies, um, what will they be doing? But also in that process to build expectable, challenging, and visionary or aspirational forecasts to look at what's likely, what's challenging, and what's uh, aspirational and consider that. And that's what our scenarios will do. Uh, and provide and widely distribute these scenarios as a tool for public health agencies, organizations, and schools to think about the future. So I'm honored to be here at this public health um, uh, program here. And, um, and, uh, and as I say, you're getting, you're getting a pre-release version 
of, of this. Um, and in terms of developing the scenarios, we considered the key drivers shaping public health. Uh, we developed expectable, challenging, and aspirational forecasts for six different drivers. And those are, those are on our website as well, the, the, those uh, drivers we used. We then took those to experts. We did, in, in effect, sort of key informant kind of interviews, but we did them having putting forecasts in front of people to get them to react to. We had a great group of advisors for our project that included David Fleming of Seattle, head of Seattle King County Health Department, uh, Jonathan Fielding, head of LA County Health Department, um, the heads of ASTO and HO and, and, um, and APHA. Uh, and uh, they helped us significantly develop, the, develop these scenarios. Uh, and then we went to four uh, local and state, I'll tell you those in a minute, we actually went to three local health departments and one state department and developed scenarios with them focused on their particular futures. Um, and then we developed the national scenarios that I'm going to present to you. As we did that, one of the ways that we as futurists at the Institute for Alternative Futures think about the future is to say, as I mentioned, you need to think about what's expectable, what's likely. That's the center part of this, uh, this diagram. It's our expectable and conventional. It's our best guess of what's happening. But in virtually all cases, the lower side of this chart identifies yeah, what's challenging. In, in many cases, we can see that better when we're in despair. Uh, uh, when our mood is down, or when we've just gone through a major recession. On the other hand, um, the question we should all ask ourselves is, what is success? What's our aspiration? What's our vision for health and for public health? What's that look like? And what are those futures? And we argue that you have to develop futures in each of those three spaces, expectable, challenging, and visionary. We did that, <clears throat> excuse me, as I said, with uh, a, a rural health department, Fargo Cass, North Dakota, uh, with a mid-sized, the city of Boston health department, and a large um, health department, over 750,000. Uh, we discounted, we should tell you, LA, Chicago, New York, we counted as, they're special. They're sort of too big to, to be normal. So we, we went with a large uh, ca uh, urban county in Ohio, Cuyahoga County, around Cleveland. And then we went with the state of Virginia. And we did scenarios for them. And those, were, those, those again, are on our website. Um, the final versions will be going up over the next month. But the preliminary versions are there now. Um, we did all that. And then we ended up with four scenarios for public health nationally. These are the national scenarios that I'll walk through. The first is one step forward, half a step back. There's a lot of good things going on in terms of public health and what it can do. Um, but it's not uniform health. Public health, the, you know, there's a statement that if you've seen one of the 3,000 public health departments in the U.S., you've seen one of the public health departments. There's a lot of variance in this scenario and um, that says that we move one step forward and half a step back. The second scenario, overwhelmed uh, and under-resourced, expresses the condition that many public health departments face now. There's a host of challenges that will make that even worse as we move forward. Scenario three is a sea change for health equity, and that says what, given changes fundamental in health care uh, and in, this, in communities, what would it look like in terms of public health's role? Uh, and likewise, if uh, in scenario four, if there are both this move and change in values to support health equity, but harder economic times, greater unemployment, uh, what would then public health and community health become? That's what the fourth scenario explores. So, so the first step, and, and these, um, I'll make sure that you've got the latest version of these, but th what I'm walking through, the text version is available, and uh, you've got the slides. You feel free to distribute these, these slides to, uh, to anyone. Um, but so, so the first scenario, uh, one step forward, half a step back. Uh, basically, public health agencies advance capabilities and technology and big data analytics. Uh, one advice to you as students, don't leave school without being able to do significant analysis, because the, the future value added of much public health is in that arena. And the question is, we'll, and, and we'll, we'll tell you what happens in some of the scenarios as we go through, but that's, um, but and so public health though in this scenario is restrained by the high costs of healthcare, that you know, we get more universal coverage, but healthcare costs don't come down as, as people thought they should. There's great variation in public health agencies technological capacities, funding, services, and effectiveness. They just vary widely from state to state and within states. Uh, public health funding varies widely. Federal funding for healthcare programs is reduced as access to care 
improves. So Ryan White, maternal child health, some of the fundamental programs that flow through public health departments, the personal health services component of those get reduced as healthcare takes over uh, the, uh, doing that. And that, that public health refocuses on prevention and improving community conditions. Um, public health cons agencies consolidate and share services, most improve comparability. Uh, and they show positive return on investment in many cases. Um, big data emerges uh, in that that's, that comes from a variety of sources. Uh, and surveillance is improved by a variety of monitoring that we do um, with personal devices that we wear and that's aggregated, that in our communities there's increased environmental monitoring and all of that comes together. Public health agencies provide quality control for this mass growing set of data. Um, and, and some nudge social networks. In other words, social networks and group nets will continue, social media will continue to evolve. And one role that public health agencies play is to guide and help with that being positive in terms of health promotion. Uh, when, uh, when possible, public health agencies automate their inspections. Uh, they enhance population health and monitoring um, and, and improve emergency preparedness. Uh, those are core functions that, that expand. The automating inspections is a significant role because it changes what public health agencies do. And again, it's quality control of the inspections, not doing the inspections itself. Um, some public health agencies, however, are confined to mandated roles. So they only do emergency preparedness, uh, the quality safety inspections, and infectious disease control. And that's all, in some cases, it's a red state, blue state issue and red states just keep public health in its place in that context. Um, others, um, uh, other public health agencies are able to emphasize prevention. Whoops. So um, in, in all of the scenarios, but including this first one, um, climate change is happening and that you get more extreme weather events uh, and that leads to vector-borne infections and a variety of, of conditions, including uh, Lyme disease and dengue fever. And, and our local scenarios um, map the differences between Virginia, the Ohio River, the, or the, the northern part of Ohio, um, Fargo, uh, in terms of, in Boston, in terms of the extreme weather events that they will be facing. All of them, though, will be facing a variety of challenges, and other parts of the country uh, the same. Uh, public health uh, agencies use simulations and gamification uh, to prepare communities for emergencies, and so a lot of pre-emergency work is done in games, in sophisticated games. The um, healthcare reform is largely implemented, uh, and this, this is our expectable forecast, that that happens and you get ex expansions of ex accountable care organizations. Um, the triple aim is pursued uh, and patient-centered medical homes become the norm. The triple aim means that healthcare providers have as one of their three major goals improved population health. So healthcare providers focus more consciously than now on what it means to improve population health. Uh, care improves by knowledge technologies, and uh, Doc Watson uh, is the cognitive computing tool that has that grew out of Watson beating humans in jeopardy. The next application was Doc Watson in healthcare. IBM deployed this knowledge gathering tool and put it in the hands of oncologists that's going throughout healthcare. And we just forecast that those cognitive computing tools will be out there and there will be a public health Doc Watson. So that, that the, you know, what do we know? What works? What works in what settings? What's the variation in those? Those will all be, uh, be available. Um, the, uh, and public health agencies focus on prevention um, with varying roles with uh, accountable care organizations. So in some cases, um, you know, they just don't get let in. Um, the healthcare providers don't, you know, they ignore the health department. And others, they play a significant role, health departments do, in community assessment, shared community assessment. And in other cases, in a minority, um, public health departments are able to actually be a, a low cost provider uh, for funding that, that health departments put out. So, overall, in this scenario, scenario one, healthcare costs continue to rise as access improves, social determinants of health, though in this scenario are not significantly addressed. Uh, there are no game changers. Um, overall in public health uh, and disparities continue. So that's scenario one. I'd like you to think about how likely that is because I'm going to walk you through the other two. Any uh, questions or comments 
about scenario one. Okay, I will, I'll keep moving. Uh, scenario two. So, um, you know, there are parts of scenario one that were bad. Uh, this, this is, scenario two gets more significant. Um, one, we get severe recessions again in 2016 and 2023. Uh, public health funding is reduced. Many programs are eliminated. Many public health programs are eliminated. Uh, and the public health agencies are blamed for the lack of preparation and ineffective responses to climate change. So while they were not able to do more, they got blamed for, for what, what came out of that. Uh, the public distrusts public health agencies and the federal government in general and health care as well. And so that, that they remain on the outside. Distrust grows. People, more people refuse to get flu shots. I noticed in Sacramento, um, uh, there was an editorial yesterday on, on this. But in this scenario, that happens more and more. And it makes the flu epidemics that come in the future more, even more disruptive. Um, and including highly, highly virulent flu strain in 2020 that were unprepared for. And tens of thousands of people die. Um, citizen science grows in all the scenarios. Basically, the ability of communities and individuals to do a variety of monitoring. You really get smart about what's going on, to use the, their personal biomonitors and their environmental monitors. In this scenario, though, that citizen science um, basically serves the affluent and middle class areas where it's done. It's not community wide, um, and it exacerbates disparities. Um, public health agency, public, uh, health agency healthcare services are cut despite the fact that healthcare reform in this scenario doesn't go much further. Healthcare needs and lack of access increase at the same time that cities are going bankrupt, that public health departments are closing, and that health programs are being uh, defunded, including uh, needed um, safety net health programs that healthcare, um, public health uh, provides. On the other hand, there's excellent personalized care in this scenario, if you can afford it, you can get great care. Um, the, uh, there are also innovative private sector approaches to health, but again, those are for, for, for people who can afford it. Um, in this scenario, the methane belch happens. There are a variety of things that could accelerate climate change. One is a huge methane release that accelerates climate change, it accelerates warming, it accelerates sea level rise. That happens in this scenario. So you end up with climate refugees uh, and migrants all over the world, including in parts of the US, but many coming to the US or trying to come to the US. Um, health violence and discrimination wor worsens. Uh, public health agencies are overwhelmed, uh, struggling to recover. And so that again, the, there's a range of extreme environmental events occurring all over the United States. There's sea level rise, and that gets worse uh, in this scenario. Uh, public health agencies are understaffed and overwhelmed. Many claim that that's what they are now. In this scenario, that becomes worse. Uh, many um, universities uh, shut down their public health departments. Um, private sector in innovations ignore disparities and vulnerability. And in effect, sort of this is, uh, there's no jobs out there. There's no departments to send people to. People aren't taking the programs. Um, and the, you know, and again, disparities increase. Uh, there's worsening uh, disparities in health, <clears throat> health quality and health care access uh, in effective prevention and in other public health services. And so just, you know, the disparities are increasing across all of those spectrums. So that's scenario two. And again, how likely is that? Is scenario one more likely or less likely than scenario two? Part of your job in becoming a futurist is to think about that. And, and it's interesting as we go around the country and talk about these kinds of scenarios, the closer we are to a recession, the more scenario two looks like that's the more likely one. But part of what we ask is, what is aspirational? What's visionary? What would public health and health look like if it looked like it should? And that's what scenario three and scenario four look at and consider what the pathways to that are. And so scenario three, see change for health equity. Um, there are changes in values and demographics. And part of the issue here is there are underlying changes in the population that are taking place. And that whereas we saw the rise of the Tea Party and its visibility over the last six to eight years, we see the rise of significant support for um, health equity and, and a variety of things that that means. Uh, in this scenario, the economy does not tank. It actually recovers well and that the physical pressures on state and local governments 
is dramatically reduced. So there, there is, is money to spend on programs. Uh, public health uh, pursues advanced analytics, gamification, multi-sectoral partnerships, um, and improvements in housing, um, economic opportunity, education, and other social determinants of health. Health departments become health development agencies. Health departments become health development agencies, and they foster those things. They don't do those things, but they foster housing and other social determinants of health. Um, there, some disparities persist, but in 2030, the vast majority of Americans have attained greater opportunities for good health. In this scenario, so how do we get there? First, there's support for common sense policies that we sort of move away from the uh, significant partisanship. I may have to, we may have to change the picture here. Um, but the, um, uh, you know, th there are public support for opportunity, equity, and fairness in policies and economics, and this is significant, and that leads to minimum wage that's actually set at a living wage, uh, and support for health in all policies, um, and there's innovation in the use of technology for a variety of outcomes in this scenario. Uh, public health funding improves. Uh, eco uh, economies gradually grow, as I mentioned, and reducing fiscal strain on and cuts, uh, particularly for state and local governments. Uh, public health agencies foster uh, additional resources. They go out and part of their job is to get more resources for health in addition to public health, but for, for health, for businesses, foundations, and health care providers, ACOs. Um, and, and evaluations, health departments do evaluations, and those evaluations show and support um, public health. They support these programs. Um, Congress, and what's interesting is in this scenario, health care does get put into place, but it doesn't reduce costs significantly. And so by, 20, uh, by 2020, Health Congress says, well, actually, we should go back to what we put in the ACA and restore the prevention fund to its $2 billion level that was set in 2010. They do that in 2020, but they go the st step further in the next Congress. And as they say, health care has uh, just isn't, health is costing more, and, and the best uh, investment is not in health care. And so they take the recommendation that IOM made in 2010 and say put a tax on health care of 2% services and put that in, spend that on prevention and public health. And that gets put in place in this scenario. And that's a significant flow of funds into prevention and public health. Uh, public health agencies uh, become chief health strategists. That health development agency, they play the role as chief health strategists for their communities. And they shift away from direct services. So direct personal services are done by, by health care. Um, Public health agencies focus on collaborative networks and partnerships. And again, they use uh, simulations, forecasts, and analysis uh, significantly across uh, communities. Um, they spread best practices. Uh, and they identify the most cost-effective and appropriate providers for doing this, the, this kind of work. Uh, gaming changes communities' awareness and commitment to achieving health equity. Um, in this scenario, there's actually a game called Privileged that is um, that people play to understand sort of, wow, I didn't think I was privileged, but I graduated from college. And essentially, if you graduate from college, you're privileged in relation to the rest of the community. But playing these games is significant. Um, the public health agencies led coalitions recognized uh, and, and became recognized. Public health agencies, most people don't know what public health agencies do. In this scenario, they learn both what they do and they learn that they do play this role in health leadership as chief health strategist. Um, healthcare, uh, healthcare does improve and um, most healthcare by 2020 and, and through the next decade is capitated, effective, and accessed. Um, primary care supports community prevention. The patient-centered medical home evolves to become the community-centered health home. It's all the patients that are medical home, plus the understanding that the social determinants of health have a greater leverage on health than medical care. And that in pursuit of population health, primary care expands its community analysis. So the community-centered health home uh, becomes significant and, and widely used. Um, in addition to healthcare integrating personal biomonitoring, genomics, uh, into its analysis so that you get very personalized health care and that that's available to all and it's available to community health center populations 
in significant ways. So this advanced personalized uh, health care is that. But even more, health care focuses on, on community and community health. Um, there are federal cuts to public health programs for screening and treatment. That, that you know, there's, there's not a need for duplicated payments for, um, again, for maternal and child health, Ryan White, uh, breast cancer, asthma, um, because that's covered by health care. Who's funding yeah. the, the, uh, the wristband and the, the cuts to the federal? So, so the wristband, there's, there are several ways that the wristband's being funded. Um, you, uh, this is, um, how many of you get your health care from Kaiser Permanente? Okay. You will get a digital health coach within a decade if you're still with Kaiser. And it will be one of the better digital health coaches around. It will be supported by some kind of equipment. And it could be, it could be a, bed, a bed pad. It could be, which will get about 80% of what a sleep lab will get currently. Um, there are a variety of other tools that, this is a Fitbit, um, but so individuals will have them that will plug into their, uh, their records. Your smartphone will capture much of this. Smartphones and data plans will be subsidized. In this scenario, we used to subsidize getting a dial tone called POTS, Plain Old Telephone Service. In this scenario, and there's people out there arguing in this, this scenario, it happens, so that everybody will have a smartphone by 2020 and that those technologies will be there. The bigger question then is, well, can you get that data flow securely with privacy and discrimination protections? All those need to be in place in this scenario that happens. That goes into your health care providers. Part of public health's role is to be able to play in the space that says, when we know genomics, when we know personal biomonitoring, when we can link your, you know, your zip code. Anybody heard of zip codeomics? Remember that you heard of zip codeomics here first. And for many people, your zip code is more important than your genetic code especially if you're poor. Your zip code is more important than your genetic code. And we'll come to figure out what that means. And in this scenario, not only do we figure out what it means, but public health is in the middle of saying, what do we do about it? Uh, and in, in, in moving it. So, so, the, so there, there, there's great ex, it's a, a great expense, but it's also where healthcare is going uh, and that most people, again, are covered. Uh, there will also be um, these versions that will be free and funded by advertising. And so there's a bunch of questions. If you look at Primary Care 2025, we play out that in a little more detail. And what could go wrong with advertising-driven Doc Watsons and digital health coaches. But, but they will be out there. And, and it, it will affect um, how things um, evolve. And the big issue, for, in effect, for public health is what's the community analysis? What's social determinants? How do those integrate with these huge data pools? that we'll be looking at and, and you know, how will you be the health strategist in the context of these growing factors. And that's what, what happens in this scenario three. Um, and that, that there, so by 2030, the bottom line is there's better health and health equity. There's less demand for health care. There's improved community conditions, especially for low-income communities. So scenario four is you know, what, what happens if, in effect, economic conditions um, don't improve? Um, and what happens if there are changes, the same similar kinds of changes in values and in communities, but with much greater unemployment and with a significant near depression, uh, big recession uh, later in this decade. Um, uh, the, you get basically health improvement initiatives uh, coalesce via technology so that communities start working on their own health more significantly. Uh, and they, those coalesce into broad national public health infrastructure that's significant. Public health supports a broader community infrastructure uh, for determining best practices and knowing that. There's a value shift to equity, as there was in scenario three, that's accelerated, in this case, by another major recession and economic transformations. So jobs related to robotics, related to um, 3D printing and distributed manufacturing, related to cognitive computing. And so um, what's happened with TurboTax and tax software, or what's happened with Expedia and travel agents, um, we've, you know, a lot of jobs have been taken over. That's just the beginning. Health and healthcare and education. Some people argue professors will be a third fewer professors um, by the time we get here. 
uh, because we'll automate learning and teaching. So the issue in this scenario, there are things that like that happen. And so basically we have to invent alternative economics. Public health plays a role in supporting that, just as some public health departments now are supporting community gardening. They're figuring out both how, how, to, how to promote it, but also what kind of regulation or protections you need to make it work. Public health in this arena helps support alternative economics. Um, and that, that um, in this scenario, there's also a recognition that in pursuing health equity that we've got a lot of injustices out there that we've ignored. And truth and reconciliation commissions are created, actually, in many communities around the country. And public health agencies, again, foster that. And it's done in a way that, that is both forward-looking and looking at what has been done in the past. And many people come to realize sort of what role, you know, my family history had in, in this. But, um, but public health, in effect, also leaves behind many of its current functions and supports many of these movements. Um, group nets, and that's, group nets are the next version or uh, iteration of social media. It's a very intense, small group um, a set of factors that people live with, uh, and it provides um, um, peer support and peer pressure. And public health agencies help evolve those so that they're actually peer uplift uh, in terms of what they do. Um, community activity and organizations are focused on health. That's a conscious part of things. Public health agencies uh, lead on information quality and community facilitation. So community facilitation, this role of chief health strategist, those are significant. But also information quality is part of what public health does. And that is, you know, is what's being reported in terms of safety or environmental um, controls or environmental uh, pollution uh, or the looks at the disease patterns um, in the community you know, what, and even the safety. In, in, the, in, in this scenario, as well as the other ones, um, quality in your restaurant is monitored, safety in your restaurant, rather, is monitored by a variety of tools that are automated. And it, uh, the quality of the food is reported now in Yelp. Uh, in the future, Yelp will also per, uh, report on the safety. And public health basically helps those reporting tools make sure that they're accurate and that the systems are working. Um, the, um, and the health records are integrated with other personal and community data to allow um, health analysts uh, analysis and targeting. That becomes significant. Again, it's a major role for public health agencies. Community uh, health learning systems occur as well in the effect that nationally communities are pursuing this. And with the help of public health agencies, excuse me, they're also determining what works and that those become a national network and a community health learning system that determines sort of what, what is it that's out there. Games and sim simulations uh, improve community engagement and planning. Um, uh, environmental health evolves. And in this scenario, it's not only environmental safety and health, but it's actually environmental improvement. In this scenario, there's a conscious national decision to try to do something about climate change. So there's a significant push to say, how do we create the equivalent of no emission zones in our communities? How do we dramatically change our, our carbon footprint? Uh, and public health agencies take on supporting that kind of role uh, in, significant, uh, in significant ways. Um, uh, and including the expanding uh, renewable energy uh, and the use of that. Um, the other thing that public health agencies do is get really good at pre-event preparation and resilience. And what that means is that, you know, not only, you know, and again, in this scenario, we don't, we're not, we're slow, we're slowing um, climate change down, but we're not stopping it. And so there's just lots of nastiness happening throughout the country. And that what public health agencies do is really get people focused on pre-event uh, resilience. And resilience means a couple things. One is, in many cases, it means things like creating mixed income neighborhoods uh, in creating changing the social determinants of health before the storm comes. Uh, but then also practicing emergent phenomenon after the storm. So after Sandy, there was a thing called Occupy Sandy, emergent phenomenon where hundreds of people within hours were distributing food. And in this scenario, gaming and simulating that becomes part of what public health does, enabling communities to step up 
and do things after the storm, but also changing community conditions to make the community more resilient before the storm. Um, governments spend less and they spend smarter. So uh, again, this is, uh, the, the economic conditions are not good in this scenario and there's a lot of job loss. So governments don't walk away from what they should be doing. There is, there is increased support for equity and so there are policies like enhanced earned income tax credit, negative income tax kind of things, but there's not enough money for that to go around. So people, um, and, and unemployment is growing. And, and, the, and so the, even the tax base for, for, from jobs is declining. What that means, as I mentioned, that there's a shift to alternative economics. And other people's basically find ways to trade their time and services, to grow their own food in communities, to do self-production. There is advanced uh, food production in many homes, aeroponics and other things that takes place and that that's shared in communities. That, so that many of our needs are met short of, of cash and, uh, and paid work. Um, and that there's an economic and social justice um, movements that progress, as I mentioned, truth and reconciliation processes spread. Uh, there's new legislation that promotes social and economic fairness. Um, and public health graduates are trained for community engagements and advanced analytics, two of the core things that run through that, but particularly in this scenario. Public health agencies serve as effective, effectively as chief health strategists. Uh, and that disparities are reduced uh, and the nation is, is largely unified in seeking to eliminate them. And so, so that's, those are the scenarios. In the report, one of the things that when you do scenarios, if you look at, you know, there are a number of things happening, aspects of the scenarios, and we compare those. And so in the, in the report, you can look at that and think about those. And if you're in particular parts of public health like epidemiology, there's detail uh, that, that looks at, at that. Now I'd said that I would encourage you to think about the likelihood and preferability of the scenarios. And so, so the, um, if I were to ask you which one of these four is most likely, I'm going to ask, do a quick show of hands. This is, I'm shortcutting this. Instead of voting 0 to 100, I'm saying which one is most likely. So, um, and I'll start at the bottom. I'm going to ask 4, 3, 2, 1. So how many people think four is most likely? Raise your hand, you get one vote. You're not, you're not from Chicago, so you only get one vote. Okay, how many think three is most likely? Okay, one optimist here, um, two. Okay, how many think two is most likely? Ooh, okay, so let's call that about 20. How many think one is most likely? Okay, about 40 or something. Um, my, my math is not real good, but, but that's roughly what it is, and thank you for, you know, one is supposed to be most likely the way we write it, if it weren't, we'd be in trouble. Uh, how many think uh, if we do preferability? Um, raise your hand for the one you think you prefer the most. How many prefer scenario four? How many prefer scenario three? How many prefer scenario two? Okay, good, okay, it's scenario one. <laughs> okay, so, so four wins by about, it's sort of uh, 40, 40 to 30. Uh, and so, so the point of that is, that in many cases we do strategic planning and we think about what's most likely and we plan against it and we help create it. And we don't focus enough on what we prefer, what we want to create. And so we use that particular polling to get people to think about sort of what is it, what's preferable versus what's, uh, what's likely uh, in that. Um, but let me ask then the, um, um, you know, what will jobs in public health be like? These are some questions for you based on the scenarios. And also, I'm open to your questions. I'll take questions now. But uh, a couple of the big things are, um, uh, what will jobs in public health be like in the next few years and over the decade ahead? Any reactions to what jobs will be like? Well, I think you mentioned the analytics in the big data and all of these wristbands are collecting so much information and the genetic revolution is here, but we don't quite know how to integrate all the data with that sort of medical context, the zip code. It's just overwhelming sometimes, but people have to be able to do it. The insurance companies, Kaiser, they probably have far ahead, but we don't know how they're using it. But people have to be trained to so that's a skill and a knowledge set. There's some refinements in the scenarios I didn't have time to get into, but one is um, in many cases, 
as you say, you know, insurance companies and healthcare providers are doing big data analytics and they actually pay more. And so often those folks get hired away from public health departments uh, is one of the, in, in several of the scenarios that, that's, that occurs. Um, other questions, yeah, or comments, yeah. Um, just in terms of jobs, like I, I said before, I'm a dietitian, registered dietitian, and so in school, it seemed that all of our education was focused on clinical nutrition, so working in the hospital, helping to treat people after they've gotten sick, and it, I always thought, like, well, why don't we try to prevent sickness in the first place? So I would hope that, you know, education for at least dietitians goes more on the prevention side and community health, hopefully. That's, that, that makes sense. And the, the dietitians, if we had our long list, they're, they're, those associations have been our clients as well. But, um, but yes, that, you know, it's the case that, that um, and, and nutrition is it's a separate conversation. But, um, so other questions or comments uh, about, the, about the scenarios? Okay, great question, and there are a number of different parts. One is healthcare will become more personalized, genomically and individualized with biomonitoring in terms of clinical perspective. But healthcare, as it pursues the triple aim in particular, will focus on increased population health. In order to do that, they'll focus on community health, and, and they, you, know, you, you may know that the healthcare reform requires hospitals to excuse me, do community uh, health needs assessment and look at what needs are in communities and fund some of that. So there's going to be increased movement uh, in scenarios one, three, and four where healthcare will pay more attention. In the scenario four in particular, it becomes community-centered health homes. But so it's, you know, we will focus on the individual with greater targeting, with greater capacity to say what do you or I need specifically, and we'll do that at the nutritional level and in a variety of other different ways. Um, but healthcare will, will also uh, increasingly look at what, what needs, what, what, are the needs, what are the needs in the community. We didn't phrase it quite that way, but what other emergent properties, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, the things that were sort of either, either unanticipated or uh, that came out, but, but one was this, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There were some others, uh, things which we hadn't gone in seeing. Um, one was creating whole new positions in public health departments uh, to deal with sustainability, uh, and many are already creating positions to deal with equity. But and so those, but but sustainability was a was new positions, and um, so those those were among the the ones that we didn't hadn't thought about going in. Um, you dealt with some negatives like a recession and climate change. What about war? Um, Is that no, no, it's not. Yeah, it's not. That would be a whole different and, 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 and you can do war at multiple levels. Uh, we, we focus on the U.S. here. And the question of, and we didn't, there were things like um, uh, it was, we figured it was sort of more likely we'd be invaded by climate change refugees than, than anybody else. But, but, there, but on the other hand, there's some real nasty terrorist and bring down the economy and get the grid, the electric grid, 
or the internet grid. I mean, there are a lot of those things that we could have put in. Uh, just like there are even the you know nasty upon nasty of the epidemic pandemic that we didn't we didn't go as far as we could have with that. But war, um, uh, yeah, there were just we, we didn't didn't deal with that. I have a question about what she mentioned about war. Uh, so we wouldn't have war here in the U.S. But what about how is it that you didn't present anything about how is it that the department will deal with uh, soldiers coming back? So how do we address that? Because I mean, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, all the soldiers coming back, we have a big problem with mental health. So how is well, well, we should change it from PTSD to PTS, PTS, um, post-traumatic stress, um, and uh, there's a huge, a huge issue. And I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't claim to be a, uh, have focused on that the way I focused on a number of other things, but those, you know, what it's, it's also saying is that I mean, there's a lot. Of, there was PTS uh, stress after World War II, but we didn't pay much attention to it. It's clear after Vietnam, uh, and there's still lingering effects in homeless people around the country in that way, uh, and that there's much in, um, in Iraq that we don't deal with. So, so there are a lot of lingering effects of our involvement in certain wars um, that, will, that, that will persist. And the, and the question is whether um, health care, sort of what does health care do about it? In scenario four, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, uh, you know, could, depending on how those post-traumatic stress people felt, be affected by the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. So, okay, well, and one more question. Or I may have gotten all of your questions answered. And then, so, so if I were to say, you know, the future of public health, um, I, you know, be ready to facilitate, be ready to see public health as this chief health strategist officer, Recognize the possibility that there will be challenging economic and physical times. Make sure that people understand what public health does and, and support that in whatever ways that you can. Um, watch, uh, uh, my next stop is the LA County Public Health Department. Look at their strategic plan. On their website is their 2013 to 2017 strategic plan. And their goals, I think, I think are, are fantastic. There are a few things that these scenarios would add. But the question of, of uh, sort of just be ready and, and, and be ready to keep asking yourself, what value are you bringing? Because in your professional lifetime, much more than my professional lifetime, there will be things that take over certain jobs. You know, like this, you know, if you were training to be a tax accountant and TurboTax came along, or you're training to be a public uh, a travel agent, and Expedia came along. Well, there are parts of public health that will be automated. And just you have to be ready for that, and ready to say, what's the next value added? You know, the, we, I, we haven't seen many forecasts for robot community facilitators. So keep that in mind as you think about that. But, but thank you. Thank you so much. A, a wise person once said that the best way to guarantee a bright future is to create one yourself. So yes. uh, this is uh, making you a honorary member of our program. Well, and thank the you. Of things that we thank do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And, and this is us. this is an aspiration uh, because it's a size smaller. So if I lose some weight, <laughs> it's my aspiration. I could wear it. Thank we'll you very much. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. <laughs> thank you thank all you. for joining us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.